and it turned out that God used that or something they said or then you can speak into their lives and you can believe things. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have. Lord God, you are, Lord God, the giver. You give us every good and perfect gift. And your word says, oh, Lord God, that when we imitate you, when we give, oh, Lord God, Lord, it's given back to us in good measure, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. And God, we don't even deserve that, but that's what you do, Lord Jesus. Right now, we ask you to receive, oh God, this worship in our giving, oh Lord God, and that you would multiply it, Father, for the furtherance of your kingdom, Lord Jesus. Father, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Ushers, you may come and collect our tithes and offerings. Um, tonight, I've asked uh, Joey, he had a special uh, message on his heart to share with us tonight for the last sermon of 2020. I'm going to ask him to come right now and get ready to share it. Let's uh, receive Joey right now. Amen. Why don't we give the Lord a praise offering for bringing us through this year? Amen. Amen. Oh, what a year this has been for the people of God. Time of dis a lot of discouragement that the enemy has been trying to throw at us because of everything that has been going on. Most of us have been going, all of us have experienced this for the very first time. And, and as we conclude this year, the question is, well, what's our hope for 2021? What's our... What do we have to cling on to when, when it comes to our faith? Because we have no idea what the next year will bring. No idea. But our confidence is that he knows, that our Lord knows. And I've learned through my own experiences something that happened in 2019 when I was in the hospital, that I have no control over the next seconds of my life. Only he does. Only he knows what's going to happen 10 seconds from now. I don't. And in a way that prepared me for what we were going to go through, the people of God were going to go through during this very tumultuous year. Let's enter into a time of prayer and invite the Lord's presence. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, I pray, God, that you will be with us this evening. Lord God, right now, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for bringing us through this year, Lord God. This has been a very tumultuous year, Lord Jesus. There's a lot of death and disease, Lord God, and infringement upon our freedoms, Lord God. We have no idea, Lord God, what's coming. But Lord Jesus, our confidence is that you do, Lord. I pray, God, that you will sit on every word that is spoken tonight and that it will be to the furtherance of your kingdom, Lord. We invite your Holy Spirit here. In your name, Father, we pray. Amen. So as I was praying about what we were going to discuss this evening, the message that God had given me centered around this, con this theme of peace. And um, we had just celebrated the Christmas season. The, the coming of the Son of God into the world was supposed to be the greatest event in the history of the world, the history of the universe. God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us, the greatest gift of peace that could ever be given in human history. So then when I was speaking with the Lord and I was asking, Lord, what am I supposed to share? What kernel of truth. After every bit of discouragement that happened this year, what can I give the people of God? What can you give the people of God so that they can have encouragement going into the next year, that you're still going to be God in their lives? Tell them about my peace. So the name of this message is, is, is titled, The Lord Our Peace. And many of you are familiar with the Lord's name, Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is our peace. What better hope of the world than God himself? And the foundation for the scripture comes out of Psalm 62, verses 5 through 8. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend upon God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, 
for God is our refuge. Praise the Lord Jesus. What confidence that we have that amidst everything that happened, God's message to us is take refuge in me. Don't take refuge in the things that are going on in this world. Don't take refuge in the things that you hear in the media or, or by government. Take refuge in me because through it all, I have remained the same. The first point I will leave with you is do not doubt the sovereign God. One of the things that this virus has taught us, this whole experience throughout this entire year, is that it tested our faith. It tested how strong is our faith in God and the God that we serve. Before this whole pandemic hit, where was our faith in God? It was, fun, it, was, it, was, it was full of encouragement and full of life when we weren't going through this. But now that we went through one of the most cataclysmic times in world history, our faith has been shaken to the core. And I speak for myself. My faith was, was, was shaken. Lord, I can't gather with the people of God. I can't go to church. I can't fellowship. I can't. I can't uh, be with my family. My brother has his own family now. I've barely been able to see my nephew uh, who was just born. I mean, Lord, where? Lord, I'm, tr- I'm going to have faith in you. I'm going to have faith in you. But Lord, all of this darkness is all around me. What am I supposed to do? Doubt begins to creep into our minds. Lord, are you still protecting? Are you still the sovereign God? Because everything before the pandemic was taught in theory. It was easy to come to church and sit in a pulpit and and listen to an hour-long message and then go home and then that's it for the rest of the week. But now is the time when the people of God are being tried and tested by fire. The Lord had, had, had foreseen that this would happen. The prophets foretold that such things would happen. And that the people of God will be tested. Their faith will be tested. And whether or not doubt would creep into the minds of the people of God. Lord, I know you tell us our faith in you, but that one little conjunction in that sentence. But I trust in you, God, but do not doubt the sovereign God. Matthew 14, 28 through 31. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you. Walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? During this time of terrible storms, the Lord is calling the people of God out onto the waters with him. Do we answer in faith or do we doubt him now? When our faith matters the most. Peter did not realize that the person that called him out onto the waters was the God who commanded those waves. The one who had authority over the might of the winds and the waves was calling out to Peter to come out onto the water. Did Peter know who was calling him? But we find this situation play out again in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, meaning Jesus, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall, meaning storm, came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up and rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet! Be still! Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Even after the disciples witnessed the miracles Jesus had done with their own eyes, they still questioned his power to save and protect them. The same scenario has repeated itself with the people of God throughout history, especially now. This entire pandemic, this entire year represents the storm that is coming over the boat that is carrying the, God's people. And instead of being, being confident that the God who commands the waves is sleeping below deck, 
Everyone else has been telling us their fear. Be afraid. Be afraid. Be afraid of this. Be afraid. Not knowing that the God who commands all things, all things must be brought unto the submission of God's authority. All things. The virus and everything else is no exception to that. Now is the time when we need to move our faith from theory and apply it to our very own lives. When it matters most, do we know who is sleeping beneath the deck? When our lives are going through the most terrible of times, like this horrible year, do we trust that the God who is sleeping below deck has the power and authority to say, quiet, be still. The same God who calmed the winds and the waves is the same God we serve today. The God who parted the Red Sea before the people of Israel is the same God who can tell this pandemic to stop with just a breath from his nostrils. Instead of maintaining the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, we've traded it for the fear of the world, which satisfies all conventional understanding. It makes sense to be afraid. But how many times has the Lord said, do not fear throughout Scripture? How many times is that reiterated? By our Lord. This is what John 14, 27 says. Very clear and straight to the, straight to the point by, by our Lord. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Tell you, tell you what, let, just take a look at the world for a minute and everything that the media has been telling you and everything that governments have been saying, whether it be here in the United States or across the world. What exactly have they said that have given us any ounce of peace over this whole year? I do not give peace as the world gives. What does that mean? How in, well, Lord, okay, I, I'm trying to understand. You don't give peace as the world gives, so what kind of peace is it? Well, think of the scenarios that we just read. Every time that the Lord had said, why are you still afraid? It was always in a situation of complete and utter torment. You're seeing the waves come up, and you think that they're going to crash on you. But the Lord says, why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? Do you not know who I am? These winds bow to me. The waves answer to me. Do you not see that I've set the boundaries of the oceans at such and such a place? Do you not see that I've set the spread of the land of the expanse in such and such a place? Do you not know that I have command over the mountains? If I tell them to move, they must move. Do you not know that the earth is in the, is in the exact spot it needs to be away from the sun in the solar system? Do you know that I keep that in, in perfect order? All the stars answer to my authority. Everything answers to me. So why are we afraid? People of God, there's no reason to be. Because the God who oversees all, the God who has authority over all, is still in command. Note that in John 14, 27, when he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, there's no exception to Jesus' stipulation to not, let, to not let our hearts be troubled and to not be afraid. Why is that? Because he is still in command. He's sovereign. His word still has control. Nothing, not even death itself, can circumvent his power. Jesus proved that on the cross. Death, the final, the, the, the final foe, was defeated. And not even death has any sway over the lives of the people of God. Not anymore. We've been set free. The Bible says, when the Son is set free, it's free indeed. And you know what that includes? Freedom from the bondage of death. Freedom from death. We have new life. We have reason to rejoice. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 to 27, in the first part of 27, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. And the second point I'll leave with you tonight. Through it all, our Lord Jesus Christ has remained the sovereign God. The fact that we're all still here, the fact that you uh, who are watching online are still here, is a testament to the faithfulness of God in our lives. True, we've been through it. The people of God have, have always been through it. You look throughout history, the suffering of the people of God, and yet through it all, God has remained sovereign through it all. And even though that everyone has been trying to tell you to be crippled and bent in fear, God is saying, rejoice, take trust in me. 
This is not theory. This is life. I didn't call you to live in cow- and to cower in fear, to have, but to have confidence in me that I am still in control. Through it all, I am still in control. Even when the situation seems absolutely hopeless, I am still in control. Even when Jesus himself died upon the cross, God was still in control of all things. So if not even death could destroy our Lord Jesus Christ, how much less now that Jesus is alive? Psalm 23, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Wait a minute. This is David. This is David speaking. He did not know the gift that we had in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wasn't living in him. Jesus Christ hasn't come yet. How did he know this truth? How did he know that the Lord will be with him even if he walked through the valley of the shadow of death? Death hadn't been completely defeated yet. Jesus hadn't come. And yet David knew that even if he were to walk through that valley, that God was going to be with him and that he wouldn't need to fear it. How did he know that? What was there to fear when God himself was with David? How much more now that we have God himself living in us? God no longer exists outside of us. The Holy Spirit just doesn't descend upon the people of God and then then ascend, then leave them. His Holy Spirit now lives as a deposit within you. That incredible gift was purchased for you at an incredibly high price. And I'll tell you this, people of God, I like to think of myself as a rational thinking man, because I am, but guess what? When all of this went down, no reason, no any sort of analysis would have been able to give me peace for this season. None. Because I'm a very anxious person, especially when something doesn't seem like it's within my control. And this definitely wasn't. I thought, that's it. This is the, this is the, uh, this is the apocalypse. You know, there's there going to be torment and pain and suffering and agony. And, you know, there was, there was, there was a lot of that. But for some strange reason, I was able to maintain a peace that I didn't, that I otherwise would have never had. And this started in the end of uh, 2019. Was it in September, Papa, when I was in the hospital? My heart went into atrial fibrillation and I ended up in the hospital. I had no idea if I was going to live until the next day. It just came suddenly like that. I had my plans. I was ready to go. You know, I was, you know, for all I knew that I was going to study for law school the next year. I, I just, I had my agenda set out. But here it is. Something got in the way, and now it could cost me my very life. Everything. Okay, whoa, 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 whoa wait a minute. I thought, I thought I was going to live to be 70 or 80. Now I have no idea if I'm going to live the next few hours. Imagine the torment that I was going through. I was alone in that hospital room with all of these wires hooked up to me. I had no idea if I was going to survive the next day. And all I could do was just lift my eyes up to heaven, and I start weeping, and I say, God, I'm sorry. I know I failed you. I know I failed you. I didn't do what you had called me to do. Fear gripped me in that moment. And then in the following day, and in the following day, they were going to get ready to do a surgical procedure on me. And by the grace of God, when they wheeled me into the, into the room where you go into before they take you to the operating room, the doctor walks into my little section. He looks at my heart monitor and says, we don't need to do this operation. You're not broke. Your heart is normal. That was a miracle of God. But the most amazing thing of that was is that God was reminding me that even when you have no idea of the next seconds you are going to come see me, guess what? I am still in control. I am still Jehovah Rapha, the great healer. So when this whole pandemic hit, I was reminded of what God did for me in that hospital room. So even though I was locked down, when, when my grandmother was passing away because of this whole thing, she she had passed away earlier this year, and my mother was about to drop because she was her caretaker 24-7. All of this was going on, and I had no idea how, how the church was going to be able to be sustained from all of this. I was able to have peace because I remember what God did for me then. Lord, I have no idea what's waiting for me in about 10 seconds, but you do. 
And I know that no matter what comes my way, nothing can have victory over me because I have an eternal promise in Christ Jesus that to live is Christ, to die, I gain the kingdom of heaven and I gain my eternal citizenship with my Lord. Nothing can defeat me. Nothing can take that away. I'd say that as someone who is very much driven by wanting to control things and wanting to make sure that everything is, there's a, there's a, there's a solution to the problem. There was no solution to this problem. There was no solution. All I could do was say, God, I turn my eyes towards you. You know all things. I don't. You have control. I don't. You know what's going to happen in the future. I don't. So, Lord, I turn my eyes towards heaven where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. And through it all, I have no idea what's coming, but it is well with my soul, and I will see your name glorified above it all. And here's a verse that's cited a lot, but now we get to apply it. Philippians 4, beginning in um, verse 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We say that a lot, but now we get to apply it. To not be anxious about anything. And I'm a very anxious person. But here the Lord is telling me, do not be anxious. Why? Because he's living in me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear nothing. I will fear no evil. For my God, the author and the perfecter of my faith, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Jesus Christ, my Messiah, lives in me. If there's one thing that has been proven through this whole pandemic, is that nobody knows anything about anything. Experts continue to shift goalposts on things and make themselves appear consistent. But this is why we cling to Christ. Because His Word is the only thing that has remained consistent in season and out of season. As a matter of fact, it, it, it's just... Just separate, just going off my notes for a minute. I read this, I read this psalm literally today, church. And um, there was one portion of it that, is, uh, that really stuck out to me and I wanted to share with you. It's not going to be up on the screen, for the, but it's from Psalm 108, 12. Listen to this. This is, this, is the psalm, this is a psalm of David. Give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. Give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. Let me tell you something. There is nothing that is going to be said by the authorities or the CDC or the federal government or the state governments that's going to satisfy your soul. That's going to give you true peace. It's the misplaced priorities that we've had. Our confidence and our security comes even when things seem grim. And that is only in Christ Jesus. Only in Christ Jesus. This is not a cliche. I'm not saying that as a cliche. Because as an anxious person, I should have lost my mind being locked up in my house for God knows how long. But I didn't. Dad, how many times have we had discussions about God's goodness even amidst this pandemic? How could that be, church? If it wasn't because we realized that God was living in our house. God was still God. Even now, when we don't know what's going to happen in the next year, God is still God. And this is what our Lord's Word says in Psalm 85, verse 8. I will hear what God the Lord will say, for He will speak peace to His people, to His godly ones. Let me say that again. I will hear what God the Lord will say, for he will speak peace to his people. When everyone else is speaking fear, my God will speak peace. That is the treasure that we have. When the world is tearing itself limb from limb, the Lord is saying, I will speak peace into your life. You will be sustained. You will be sought through. I will take you through. I will take you through the Red Sea. I will take you through the mountains. I will take you through the valleys. It is me when everything else, when all the authorities in this world are telling you to be afraid, I say, peace in your life.
The God who oversaw the creation of all things is the same God who governs all things today. This fact alone should give the people of God their rest. John 16, 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I, our Lord, has overcome the world. Isaiah 26, verse 12. Again, how did Isaiah, how did, the, how did Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, know this before Jesus Christ could come into the world? How in the world did he have this assurance? O oh Lord, you will ordain peace for us, for you have indeed done for us all our works. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And the dividing wall of hostility is the wall that had separated us from God because of sin. Jesus had taken down the, that ginormous barrier that separated us from him. So now there is nothing inhibiting him or us from being united together as one. When we accept Christ into our hearts, he takes up residence inside of our hearts. He doesn't check in for a certain season in your life and then leave. He's there as a deposit until you go to see him face to face or until our Lord comes back, he lives in you. And the third point I'll leave with you, the final point. For the new year, be still and know that our Lord is still the sovereign God. Psalm 37, beginning in verse 5 through 7. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Trust in him, church, and he will do this. The song we were just singing. His promises still stand. As someone who was on the very cusp of death at one point in my life, I was able to realize that there was nothing in this world that can give me security. Nothing in this world that can give me peace. I've studied history. I've studied it all. I've studied the utopias that, that tyrants have built up for themselves over the years, trying to say, look, if we just fashion society this way, everything will be, will be great, everything will be peaceful, everyone will be harmonious, and we've seen the destruction of multiple civilizations just within the last century. So let me tell you something. What power on this earth will be able to give you the peace that our God gives? What power? What power can the authorities now use to give you peace? Peace of the soul. What authority can give you that? Of course, you know, we, we respect this virus because it is a virus. It is serious. But guess what? It doesn't surprise the Lord. Even this whole year didn't surprise the Lord. The Lord knew this was going to happen, and guess what? History has already been written from the beginning to the end. God is the author and the perfecter. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He is the beginning of all things, and He's the end of all things. He holds the world and the universe within His hands. Nothing happens in this universe that He does not know about. He has control over all things. So at the very snap of His fingers, this virus can disintegrate into nothing. But even if it doesn't, do we have the faith that even men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had when they were being forced against their will to renounce their Lord and serve the gods of Babylon, of Nebuchadnezzar. They also didn't have the Holy Spirit. They didn't, like we did. They were at a disadvantage in comparison to us. But even when they thought they were going to die, they said, Nebuchadnezzar, and I'm paraphrasing here from the book of Daniel, our Lord is more than capable of saving us from your hand. 
But here's the kicker. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down and serve the gods of Babylon. Even if he doesn't. What faith. And yet we who have the Holy Spirit, church, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego took their faith into the furnace with them. For all they knew, they were going to be burnt and scorched by the flames. But the fire did not touch them because a fourth was in there. And Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan king, recognized him as, the, as someone who looked like the son of the gods. It was Jesus Christ in that furnace with them. Is Jesus Christ not also in this furnace with us now? He's in the furnace with us. Church, he's in this furnace with us. And no matter what happens in 2021, he will be in the furnace with us. And the flames will not scorch us. People who are watching online, I tell you, the flames will not scorch you. Jesus will be with you through it all. Exodus 14, 13. When the people of Israel will have their backs up against the Red Sea and the might of the Egyptian army was coming against them and they were terrified because they were trapped. Think about it this way. God, uh, 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 the commander of heaven's armies had placed the people of God into a trap. That defies conventional reasoning. Why would a commander of heaven's armies lead his people into a trap where they could be obliterated either by drowning in the ocean or being slaughtered by the sword of the Egyptian army? Why would God lead them there? Because God was getting ready to show his power. I don't operate by conventional understanding. I don't operate by human wisdom. As a matter of fact, it says in the word of God that the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. And here's what Moses said when everyone else was terrified because they didn't know, are we going to get out of this alive? Moses said to the people in Exodus 14, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. And the impossible happened. You know the story. The Red Sea parted before the people of Israel. With a blast of his nostrils, the mighty Red Sea had to bow at the voice of the Lord and submit. This year is a reminder for the people of God that even when things seem grim, the Lord is still sovereign and all things must ultimately answer to the power and authority of his voice. The word of the Lord is always speaking. That's why John, in the book of John, it says in the very beginning, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Why? Because in the beginning of all things, the word, Jesus, the word, the word was at the beginning. The word is constantly moving. The word is constantly holding all things together. The word, that everything in existence is held together by the word. And even now, the word of God remains sovereign. This is the message from the Lord to the children of Israel and to the people made heirs to his kingdom in the coming new year. This is what the Lord wants to say for us, church. Say to us. This is his message directly to each and every one of you. And with this, I'll get ready to close. From Isaiah 41, chapter, uh, Isaiah 41, verses 10 through 13. Fear not, for I am with you. Take this as a message from God to you personally. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing. And shall perish. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. Those who war against you shall be as nothing at all. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you.
in an agreement, I agree, I say, along with that scripture. I say to the people of God, fear not. Take courage. Stand strong. Stand firm. Be still. And we will see the salvation of our Lord accomplished. This year was a year of death and discouragement. But our God, as John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We have life, church. When the world is speaking death, we have life. And as we get ready to close, there was a song that God had used for me personally. Not too long ago, I was going through a season of spiritual challenging. I went over to Kent Island, which is going towards Annapolis. And I was, I had just gone there for just for the purpose of just relaxing and just, you know, just detaching from the day to day. But then as I was walking, I was listening to this hymn the whole way there. Be still my soul. And the Lord had turned the beaches of Ken Island into holy ground for me. And while it was, get, it was getting towards dusk, so people were leaving, it was just me. I was standing in the beaches and I fell to my knees. And I gazed upon the expanse of the sea. And a verse from the, from the song says, Be still, my soul. The waves and winds still know his voice who ruled them even while he dwelt below. The Lord was telling me, you see these seas, they answer to me. Just a little while ago, I was, um, I was fishing off the Atlantic. I was deep sea fishing. And as I was going, I was listening to that hymn again and I was seeing the Atlantic and the might of the sea before me, the open waters. And all I can think was, Lord, all of this answers to your voice. All of this, the sea, this mighty ocean, answers to your voice and to your voice alone. I am convinced, church, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that if we remain still, the Lord's power will be revealed to us in a way that we never thought was possible, and it will give us courage as we welcome the new year in triumph.